In a previous video, we looked at how CPUs can use caches to speed up accesses to memory. So the CPU has to fetch things from memory, it might be a bit of data, it might be instruction, and it goes through the cache to try and access it, and the cache keeps a local copy in fast memory to try and speed up the accesses. But what we didn't talk about is, what does the CPU do with what it's fetched from memory? What's it actually doing and how does it process it? So the CPU is fetching values from memory and we'll ignore the cache for now because it doesn't matter whether the CPU has got a cache or not, it's still going to do roughly the same things. And we're also going to look at very old CPUs, the sort of things that were in 8-bit machines, purely because they're simpler to deal with and simpler to see what's going on. But the same ideas still apply to an ARM CPU today or your x86 chip or whatever it is you've got in your machine. Modern CPUs use what's called the von Neumann architecture. And what this basically means is that you have a CPU and you have a block of memory and that memory is connected to the CPU by two buses. These are just a collection of several wires that are connecting and again we're looking at old-fashioned machines on a modern machine that gets a bit more complicated but the idea, the principle is the same. So we have an address bus and the idea is that the CPU can generate a number in here in binary to access any particular value in here. So we'll say that the first one is at address zero, and we're gonna use a 6502 as an example. We'll say that the last one is at address 65535 in decimal, or F, 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 F in hexadecimal. So we can generate any of these numbers on the 16 bits of this address bus to access any of the individual bytes in this memory. How do we get the data between the two? Well, we have another bus, which is called the data bus, which connects the two together. Now, the reason why it's a von Neumann machine is because this memory can contain both the program, i.e. the bytes that make up the instructions that the CPU is going to execute, and the data. So the same block of memory contains some bytes which contain program instructions, some bytes which contain data, and the CPU, if it wanted to, could treat the program as data or treat the data as program. Well, if you do that, it'll probably crash. So what we've got here is an old BBC Micro, it uses a 6502 CPU, and we're going to just write a very, very simple machine code program that uses one of the operating system things just to print out the letter C for computer file. So if we assemble it, we're using hexadecimal, we've started our program at 084C. So that's the address where our program's been created. And our program's very simple, it loads one of the CPU's registers, which is just basically a temporary data store that you can use, and this one is called the accumulator, with the ASCII code 67, which represents a capital C. And then it says jump to the subroutine at this address, which will print out that particular character. And then we tell it we want to stop, so we've got to return from subroutine. And if we run this and type in the address of where I've put it, 084C, then you'll see it prints out the letter C, and then we get the prompt to carry on doing things. So our program, we write it in assembly language, which we can understand as humans, ish, LDA, load accumulator, JSR, jump to subroutine, RTS, return to subroutine. You get the idea once you've done it a few times. And the computer converts this into a series of numbers in binary. The CPUs work in binary, but to make it easier to read, we display them in hexadecimal. So our program becomes A94320EEFF60. That's the program we've written. And the CPU, when it runs it, needs to fetch those bytes from memory into the CPU. Now, how does it do that? So to get the first byte, we need to put the address 084C on the address bus. And a bit later on, the memory will send back the byte that represents the instruction A9. Now, how does the CPU know where to get the instructions from? Well, it's quite simple. Inside the CPU, there is a register which we call the program counter, or PC, on a 6502, on something like a x86 machine, it's known as the instruction pointer. It has different names, it doesn't make any difference. And all that does is store the address of the next instruction to execute. So when we were setting it up here, it would have 084C in it. That's the address of the instruction we want to execute. So when the CPU wants to fetch the instruction that it's going to execute, it puts that address on the address bus, and the memory then sends the instruction back to the CPU. So the first thing the CPU's got to do to run our program is to fetch the instruction, and the way it does that is by putting the address from the program counter onto the address bus, and then fetching the actual instruction. So the memory provides it, but the CPU then reads that in on its input on the data bus. 
Now it needs to fetch the whole instruction that the CPU is going to execute. And on the example we saw there, it was relatively straightforward because the instruction was only a byte long. Not all CPUs are that simple. Some CPUs and will vary these things. So this hardware can actually be quite complicated because it needs to work out how long the instruction is. So it could be as short as one byte, it could be as long on some CPUs as 15 bytes. And you sometimes don't know how long it's going to be until you've read a few of the bytes. So this hardware can be relatively trivial. So an ARM CPU makes it very, very simple. It says all instructions are 32 bits long. So the Archimedes over there can fetch the instruction very, very simply, 32 bits. On something like an x86, it could be any length up to 15 bytes or so. And so this becomes more complicated and you have to sort of work out what it is until you've got it. But we, we fetch the instruction. So in the example we've got, we've got A9 here. So we now need to work out what A9 does. Well, we do that, we need to decode it into what we want the CPU to actually do. So we need to have another bit of our CPU's hardware, which is dedicating to decoding the instruction. So we have a part of the CPU which is fetching it, and part of the CPU which is then decoding it. So it gets A9 into it, so the A9 comes into the decode, and it says, well, okay, that's a, that's a load instruction, and so I need to fetch a value from memory, which was the 4.3, the ASCII code for the capital letter C that we saw earlier. So we need to fetch something else from memory. So we need to access memory again, and we need to work out what address that's going to be. Um, we also then need to, once we've got that value, update the write register to store that value. So we've got to do things in sequence. So part of the decode log is to take the single instruction byte, or however long it is, and work out what's the sequence that we need to drive the other bits of the CPU to do. And so that also means that we have another bit of the CPU, which is the actual bit that does things, which is going to be all the logic which actually executes instructions. So we start off by fetching it, and then once we've fetched it, we can start decoding it, and then we can execute it. And the decode logic is responsible for saying, put the address for where you want to get the value to load into memory from, and then store it once it's been loaded into the CPU. So you're doing things in order. We have to fetch it first, and we can't decode it until we've fetched it, and we can't execute things until we've decoded it. So at any one time, we'd probably find on a simple CPU that quite a few bits of the CPU wouldn't actually be doing anything. So while we're fetching the value from memory to work out what we're going to, how we're going to decode it, the decode and the execute logic aren't doing anything. They're just sitting there waiting for their turn. And then when we decode it, it's not fetching anything and it's not executing anything. So we're sort of moving through these different states one after the other. And they'll take different amounts of time. If we're fetching 15 bytes, that's going to take longer than if we're fetching one. If we're decoding it, it might well be shorter than if we're fetching something from memory because it's all inside the CPU and the execution depends on what's actually happening. So your CPU will work like this and it will go through each phase and then once it's done that it'll start on the next clock tick. All the CPUs are synchronized to a clock which just keeps things moving in sequence and you can build a CPU something like the 6502 worked like that. But as we said lots of the CPU aren't actually doing anything at any time which is a bit wasteful of the resources. So is there another way you can do this? And the answer is yes, you can do what's called a sort of pipelined model for a CPU. So what you do here is you still have the same three bits of the CPU, but you say, okay, so we're going to fetch, and I'll just use an F, instruction one. In the next bit of time, I'm going to start decoding this one. So I'm going to start decoding instruction one. But I'm going to say, I'm not using the fetch logic here, so I'm going to have this start to get things ready. I'm going to start to do things ahead of schedule. I'm also at the same time, going to fetch instruction two. So now I'm doing two things, two bits of my CPU in use at the same time. I'm fetching the next instruction while decoding the first one. Then once we've done the decoding, I can start executing the first instruction. So we'll execute that. But at the same time, I can start decoding instruction two, and hopefully I can start fetching instruction three. So what? We've still taken the same amount of time to execute that first instruction. But the beauty is when it comes to execute instruction two, it completes exactly one cycle after the other. Rather than having to wait for it to go through the fetch and decode and execute cycles, we can just execute it as soon as we finish instruction one. So each instruction still takes the same amount of time, still takes, say, three clock cycles to go through the CPU, but because we've sort of pipelined them together, they actually appear to execute one after each other. So it appears to execute one clock cycle after each other. And we could do this again, so we can start decoding instruction three here at the same time as executing instruction two. Now there can be problems, this works for some instructions, but say this instruction said store this value in memory. Now you've got a problem. 
you've only got one address bus and one data bus, so you can only access or store one thing in memory at a time. You can't execute store instruction and fetch a value from memory, so it won't be able to fetch it until the next clock cycle. So it would fetch instruction four there while executing instruction three, but we can't decode anything here. So in this clock cycle, we can decode instruction four and fetch instruction five, but we can't execute anything. We've got what's called a bubble in our pipeline it's, or pipeline store because at this point the design of the CPU doesn't let us fetch an instruction and execute an instruction at the same time. It's a, one type of what we call pipeline hazards that you can get when designing a pipeline CPU because the design of the CPU doesn't let you do the things you need to do at the same time at the same time and so you have to delay things which means that you get a bubble and so you can't quite get up to one instruction per cycle efficiency but you can certainly get closer than you could if you just had everything to do one instruction at a time. That it has to add this content is really very narrow. I think that it's the equivalent of a 15 inch screen at normal distance. So really my field of view of augmented content, and this sounds bad, but it's not that bad.